Hi, this is Jay Gosuiko with Sierra Tahoe Ski Patrol and BronzeSavage.com. In this episode, how to deal with someone who has a decreased level of consciousness, an altered level of consciousness, and you're going to have to look up AEIOU tips as an algorithm for dealing with someone who is altered or decreased in their level of consciousness. So the scenario is that you're at the mall, you're off duty with three of your medic buddies and you're looking for a Hawaiian shirt because it's Hawaiian shirt night and it's 10 a.m. You're in front of Macy's and one of your friends pulls you over and says, and you look down and there he is, 40s, 50-ish year old man, kind of on his side, on his back, moaning. You immediately check out your scene as a trained professional. You'll look for scene safety, BSI, you got a pair of gloves in your back pocket maybe, but BSI, and if there's any witnesses or any bystanders that saw it. Since it's 10 in the morning and the mall just opened, there's no one there to help you out. It's just you and your buddies. So already, as you would start to approach the scene, even from five feet away, you're already ruling out several things. And your next few seconds, you're going to be ruling in and ruling out things. So let's just go over them. You're going to rule out trauma. Because we like trauma. So, there's no pool of blood. We're uh, looking to see if he's at the bottom of the steps or underneath a balcony. If there's a walker um, and or a pet chihuahua somewhere uh, lost but close by. We want to know what's going on, and there is no signs of trauma. So we start to rule that out. We haven't full, fully ruled it out. The next thing we want to do is rule out the cardiac. That's, uh, that you can tell by his skin signs, because he's not pale, cool, and clammy, or he's not blue. If he's not blue, then you're also ruling out his lungs. You are now three to four seconds into the scenario and you immediately reach for his wrist pulse. So you're checking his wrist pulse and he's got a 72 in regular wrist pulse, which means it's perfusing a good blood pressure to his wrist and therefore you're again ruling out more cardiac issues. So at this point, you've got your ABCs. One of your friends takes off to call 911. This is not the time to turn off your critical thinking skills. It's the opposite. This is the time to turn it all on. Because in the next few seconds, what happens is your friend comes back and says, all the medics are at an MCI in Folsom, and they're 45 minutes away stuck in traffic, and all the helicopters can't fly in this weather condition. So now what do you do? Well, you've already started your assessment, so you just got to keep on going. Um, you are going to look into this person's history, but you're going to actively look for this person's history since you just can't ask him what's going on. You're going to check out, check him for signs and symptoms of diabetes. Diabetes leads to DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is not to be confused, this is a high blood sugar, not to be confused with a low blood sugar. A low blood sugar is much more emergent than a high blood sugar. So if he's got insulin in his pocket, if he's got uh, glucose gel or um, candy bars in his backpack, it might indicate that this guy is suffering from a diabetic emergency, specifically a low blood sugar. The next thing you're going to do is check him out for signs and symptoms of a history of seizures. Is he postictal? If he's got a history of seizures, he may have an empty bottle of Keppra or Dilantin in his back pocket or a prescription uh, receipt saying that he uh, had Dilantin prescribed to him and or refilled a couple of times several months ago. 
You'll also check him out for toxicology. That's pretty easy if he's a drunk and you can smell the alcohol on his breath. But he could have been doing crack cocaine or methamphetamines for several days to several weeks and now has crashed out in the mall. You also want to understand that it might be a psychiatric emergency or a psychiatric issue. He just might love getting the negative attention he gets. This is a Neptune's fork. It could be a psychiatric disorder. You're, you're already ruling out the cardiac issue, but don't rule anything out totally. He could have had a heart attack or a diabetic emergency and then fell down the stairs. So don't rule any of these out just yet until the medics get there for more a definitive ruling in and ruling out. But while you're there and you got 45 minutes to kill, let's go through some of the things that we'll do. The last thing you're going to want to rule it out for is a CVA. Signs and symptoms of a CVA is slurred speech, droopiness on one side of the face, or unilateral weakness. One side goes uh, is limp while the other side is working. So make sure to consider a stroke or a CVA. They're synonymous. The last thing you want to consider is a septic picture, an infection. At the mall, probably not, but he could be um, a gentleman who was very healthy and fit and just refused to believe that he had pneumonia and so decided to go shopping that day after a three-hour morning jog and has to finally collapse because of his rip-roaring pneumonia. If they were coming from a SNF, a skilled nursing facility, then I would be concerned about urosepsis. I'm going to abbreviate pneumonia with PNA, and I'm going to put urosepsis up there. And then, of course, the very last thing is this could be in conjunction with a lung issue. It could be an anaphylaxis reaction. If he was in the food court, I would be concerned about a nut allergy or a food allergy. And if they were in an outdoor setting, I would be concerned, concerned about bee stings or a lot of people carry uh, gorp, which has uh, peanuts in them. So, um, again, never rule anything out. Let's briefly go through all the things that you do in, a, uh, in an emergency situation when you have a lack of resources to turn to and 911 isn't showing up. Your diabetic emergency is a low blood sugar. You can assist this person if he's got a gag and swallow reflex. You can assist this person into administering his or her own meds or sugar for the diabetic. In the food court, you'll have honey and orange juice. And on the campground, you'll have uh, gel packs and goo that, you, um, that he may be able to get to and you can help him take his meds. If it's a seizure, I'd put him on his left side. Again, the aorta pumps from here to your left side. If you, if you put someone on their left side, the heart has to pump downhill, which is a lot easier than pumping uphill by putting them on the right side. So put the seizure patient, help them, put them in the recovery position or left side lying position so that if or when they vomit, they can keep their airway clear and you can assist them from not hitting their head on the pavement. So that's the reason why you put a seizure victim or a post-ictal victim into a left side line. Toxicology, you're going to want to stay safe and remember scene safety and BSI. Um, you're going to want to be able, you're going to want to stay safe and if you have to dig into his pockets, uh, beware that there may be some needles in there. Same thing with a diabetic. Cardiac, you're at the mall, someone should be going to grab an AED. Even worse, if he's got a pale, cool, and he's pale, cool, and clammy, and he's got a threatened pulse. So you want to grab, a, go run and grab an AED if there's any signs and symptoms of um, a cardiac disorder. 
The other issue is I got 45 minutes to kill. The AED is probably 60 seconds away. Might as well have that next to me um, in case anything changes or goes downhill. Lungs, I'll provide rescue breathing. One of my scenarios, I show you how to use a glove to make a barrier device for rescue breathing. I'm not exactly uh, sure how I would react if I saw a complete stranger, but if he was a buddy of mine or a buddy of buddy of mine, I might uh, think twice about providing at least one or two breaths. I'm not as I'm not too clear about the 45 minutes of uh, rescue breathing for uh, this gentleman, whoever he is. But anyway, uh, more tools for you. If it's a stroke, what's the most important thing? And I told you at the very beginning of this scenario what that important thing was. 10 a.m. Obviously, he hadn't been on the ground too long, and it was 10 a.m. when you arrived on scene. The medics are going to be 45 minutes late. They're going to want to know this very quick so they can scoop him up and go. Trauma. You're going to hold pressure on anything that's bleeding. And there's, uh, there's three spots in your, in your body that I'm worried about that uh, you'll have internal bleeding that I can't do anything about, and that's the belly, the chest, and the head. So that's pretty much your kill zone. So do a kill zone survey. Make sure that you can hold pressure on anything that's bleeding actively, and then hold C spines. That will take up that will take up one of your uh, rescuers and or innocent bystanders holding C spine. And then um, and then for sepsis, you're going to want large bore IVs so that they can give them IV antibiotics and any of these guys, you're going to want large bore IVs for fluid resuscitation and medicines. Um, so the best thing you can do when you're waiting for the medics is expose the upper arm so that the medics can immediately take a blood pressure and then put a tourniquet on and start an IV. All right, so make sure to review your AEIOU tips out of your textbook and know that it's going to be number one or number two diabetes or seizures why this guy is going to be at the mall and down if it's not trauma. And it could be a multifactorial thing. He could be feeling sick and then go boom. Or he could have a cardiac issue that turns into an aneurysm in the brain. So, um, or a uh, embolus in the brain. Anyway, there you go. AEIOU tips. I'm Jay Gosuiko with Sierra Tahoe Ski Patrol. Wear the vest, be the best. And my friend, Roz Savage at rodsavage.com. Shaka.